Relations between China and the United States will remain a major topic in 2018, but it seems the bonhomie that grew between leaders of the two sides in Mar-a-Lago and Beijing has been fading away. U.S. President Donald Trump unveiled a new national security strategy last December, addressing the America First doctrine one more time, in which he labeled China a strategic competitor and revisionist power. Does this mean the Trump administration is ready to go all out on a more adversarial relationship with China? Earlier last year, the U.S. government opposed granting China the market economy status at the World Trade Organization. So what kind of bilateral relationship does the Trump administration want vis-a-vis -vis China? Is the prospect of a trade war more likely now? And what will 2018 bring, bring to bilateral ties? Welcome to The Point. I'm Lu Xin. I'm happy to be joined by historian Dr. Dr. Neil Ferguson, who is a best-selling author and also a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Dr. Ferguson, welcome so much to the studio. Thanks for having me. Thank you. In the national security strategy uh, I was mentioning, President Trump accused China of being a revisionist power that uses technology, propaganda and coercion to shape a world antithetical to America's values and interests. What do you think he means by a revisionist power and in what case would you call a country by that? Well, I doubt very much that uh, President Trump wrote those words. Uh, the national security strategy is much more the work of his national security advisor, H.R. McMaster. Mm. Uh, but I don't think we should be too surprised that its tone is radically different from the last national security strategy produced for President Obama by Susan Rice, which was uh, remarkably emollient and indeed friendly in its tone towards China. After all, Donald Trump campaigned in 2016 mm -hmm. in a pretty strongly anti-Chinese way. Right. Uh, and I think it's easy to forget that after the mood music of Mar-a-Lago and the president's visit uh, to Beijing. Uh, we've kind of come back to where we were in 2016 in the national security strategy. So I think it's more a return to Trumpian first principles after the mood music of last year. However, it is interesting because this word revisionist is not really used very often in international politics. We haven't heard about it for a long time. But what he really meant by that, by, by, point, by saying China is a revisionist, what does China want to re re rewrite? Think? I think it's interesting that uh, China is grouped with Russia in that category. And if you read the national security strategy carefully, the phrase China and Russia keeps recurring mm -hmm. uh, and they're referred to as revisionist powers. Now what is meant there is that they are powers challenging some existing order in which the United States is hegemonic, uh, is dominant, uh, but of course the national security strategy isn't very specific about what exactly it is that China is seeking to revise. In, indeed the national security strategy is quite short on specifics. It doesn't get into much detail mm. for example on the once very contentious issue of the South China Sea. Uh, it talks about North Korea as a rogue regime along with uh, Iran that poses a threat to international order. But again, it's quite light on detail as to what exactly is to be right. done about North Korea. So I think the use of the term revisionist is rather casual and this, the, this document doesn't really tell us what precisely it is that China wants that the United States is going to deny it. However, it is pretty clear, I think, the framework or the, or the guiding principle is there that China is seen, is elevated in the level of competition or rivalry in the eyes of the United States. Uh, looking at 2018, do you think the tide is turning on bilateral ties, that we are likely see more friction, more conflict between the two countries? It's possible, but it, one has to be very careful about making any prediction about the Trump presidency because we've seen in the course of, of 12 months uh, the, the president can change direction uh, with 140 characters in the, a single tweet. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's perfectly possible that despite the current somewhat darker tone, uh, we could see a complete change within a matter of, of days. I think there are two issues to focus on. Uh, one is still North Korea. Uh, that problem has not gone away despite the talks that we're seeing between North and South Korea. I think the risk has gone down because of those talks, but there remains a fundamental problem, which is that the United States, Trump, has consistently argued 
China should do more to restrain North Korea, to impose economic pressure on North Korea, to do something to alter uh, its pursuit of a full suite of nuclear arms capabilities. Uh, and I don't think that issue has been resolved yet and it may very well resurface if, for example, North Korea conducts another major test. The second issue is trade. Uh, I think there's no question uh, that the Trump administration has up its sleeve some tough new measures directed against Chinese exports of steel and aluminium, uh, but also potentially against Chinese investment in US technology. In some ways, Trump is more attracted to trade war than to actual war. Uh, the phrase fire and fury has become very famous. It began as an off-the-cuff remark Trump made on the subject of North Korea. Right. But if one talks to people close to the president, one gets the strong impression that he doesn't really want to be a war president in the way, for example, that George W. Bush was. A trade war president may be, and I expect there to be more action on that front than on, say, the North Korean military front. Do you think um, from what is written in that book we get a better sense of what is guiding the impulses of the president? I mean, is he totally, um, a, as the book says, a rebel without a cause or does he have some kind of policy that he himself, uh, um, philosophy that he himself is following? For instance, you can see some kind of a pattern emerging from what he does about China. For instance, he's very much after the economic interests, you know, he's very much after uh, this um, negotiation style hitting hard in the in the beginning but then uh, giving you some leeway so that as if he's he's making things easier for you so you cave in to his demand do you see something like that My, Michael Wolf's book talks very little about foreign policy indeed hardly at all about China uh, it, it talks more about the Middle East uh, than about China which is odd because I actually thought the Mar-a-Lago meeting between Xi Jinping and Donald Trump was one of the most important diplomatic events of last year uh, so I'm not sure that book is a good guide to what Trump's foreign policy is all about. I've been somewhat constructive about Trump's foreign policy, partly because I thought that President Obama's foreign policy was quite unsuccessful, uh, both in East Asia and in the Middle East. And I think in two respects, uh, Trump did not have a bad year in 2017. Mm -hmm. Number one, uh, he was able to bring together anti-Iranian forces in the Middle East, uh, extending from Israel right away way uh, across to Saudi Arabia and achieve at least some kind of a reversal of his predecessor's policy on Iran. Uh, on, on East Asia, I think he did... You think that was a progress? I think it was, yeah, because I think the Obama administration's experiment with being essentially friendly to Iran did not succeed. Uh, indeed, I think it was a major mistake to do a nuclear deal with Iran that left them free to pursue uh, non-nuclear uh, efforts uh, as far afield as Yemen, uh, Lebanon and Syria. So I think it was right to change that policy because I think the policy of the Obama administration in the Middle East was an epic fail. Uh, but I think on East Asia there was also something positive to report. Most people in uh, Beijing uh, back in 2015-16 regarded the Obama administration's pivot to Asia as a failure too. Uh, what did Trump do? Well he began by playing very hard ball, the famous Taiwan call, mm -hmm. uh, but then he toned it down. And I actually thought that at mar lago he did a pretty good job uh, in terms of personal diplomacy uh, and established a better rapport with Xi Jinping than President Obama ever did. Mm -hmm. But the key issue that came up last year was North Korea. And repeatedly the president said to China, you need to do more. And I don't think he really got the kind of response that he was looking for. So by the end of last year, we were in a somewhat inconclusive state. A relationship had been established between Trump and Xi Jinping. But I don't think concrete results had really come from it. And that's why I think uh, beginning uh, in December, the administration decided to take a much tougher line, uh, both on geopolitical issues and on economic issues. And you think what we are seeing now the kind of talks between the North and the South is the result of this kind of a tough man politics, it's, policies it's of very President hard Trump? To, it's very hard to say because it's hard to understand exactly what goes through the mind of Kim Jong-un, one mm -hmm. of the most unpredictable actors uh, on the international stage. But I don't think one can say that Trump's failed. I think he's done a better job on North Korea than Obama did because Obama, remember, left office saying that North Korea was still four or five years away 
from having intercontinental ballistic missiles and miniaturized nuclear warheads. It turned out that North Korea was five months away from having that kind of technology. So the Obama administration did very badly in North Korea, and I think what you could see happening last year at the UN Security Council was a tougher American line in cooperation with China, increasing the pressure on North Korea. Those sanctions became much more serious. And guess what? Now North Korea is talking to South Korea. So there may well be some causal connection there. I certainly give Trump higher marks on this issue than I would give Obama. How do you think about, how do you comment on the kind of uh, extremely um, spicy rhetoric that he has been using and the amassing of military prowess around that uh, region and, you know, the largest joint military exercises, you know, bringing uh, aircraft carriers to that region, showing of force. Um, isn't that making the risks of a miscalculation of some kind of military conflict on the, on the peninsula much higher? Well, the way I see this is by analogy with the Cuban Missile Crisis back in the early 1960s when John F. Kennedy was confronted uh, with the prospect of nuclear proliferation uh, to the island of Cuba. And he took an extremely tough uh, military line. Uh, he, in fact, imposed a blockade. Uh, he took the world, it's often said, close, close to the brink of nuclear war, closer than at any time in the Cold War. But guess what? The result was a success. Uh, the Soviet Union blinked, a deal was done, mm -hmm. and those missiles were removed from Cuba. Uh, so we can't praise John F. Kennedy for the way he handled the Cuban Missile Crisis and then criticize Donald Trump for being tough when uh, another rogue regime, in this case North Korea, starts to proclaim its ability to hit mainland U.S. targets with nuclear missiles. I think the Trump administration was right to take a tough line. Everybody knows that it's very late in the day to achieve anything here. This should have been dealt with long ago, but the Clinton administration and the Bush administration and the Obama administration failed to deal with the problem. I think we've actually seen more progress under Trump than we saw over eight years of Obama. Uh, is there a risk involved? There is always a risk involved in any kind of geopolitical confrontation, but both China and the United States have an interest in limiting nuclear proliferation. It is in nobody's interests that this region should have more nuclear powers. If North Korea becomes an established, recognized nuclear power, then it will not be long before others follow it. And that is why I think the US and China can and should cooperate to try to address this threat together. Well, I think um, to a certain degree, yes, indeed, um, by whatever means, the fact that the two sides are sitting down and talking is a good thing. But the reason why the previous administration had failed to deliver on any progress on uh, the peaceful res resolution of this issue is because of the United States government uh, never carried out, never carried out what they promised in exchange for the uh, DPRK rolling back their nuclear program when they said they were uh, supply fuel, they didn't when they, you know, because of all kinds of reasons. So in the end, the DPRK just saw no point in sticking to the negotiation process and they went along with the, the research and development of a nuclear weapon. So uh, again... Well, if I may interrupt, that's not quite true. What has happened is that the UN Security Council has repeated, repeatedly published resolutions condemning North Korea's pursuit of a nuclear arms program and North Korea has defied the UN Security Council and has ignored the sanctions In terms that have been of imposed. UN Security Council resolutions, that is the case. Uh, however, if you look at the agreement that had been reached uh, throughout the course of the six-party talks, uh, every time there was some kind of uh, agreement, some kind of uh, progress, the United States government backed down and never delivered on those promises, thus, you know, pushing the, uh, the negotiations into a dead alley. That's why the, the DPRK did not want to talk at all. They, at a time, they were stopping their nuclear process. They were dismantling their nuclear facility. But because of this kind of uh, stepping back of the past U.S. administration, you know, no more trust anymore. Because well, as they I've can't said, I don't regard previous administrations as having handled this problem so well. So what I'm trying to say is maybe um, whenever you come to any kind of agreement that you have to really deliver. You have to be able to uh, continue to build confidence that the DPRK can trust that the United States is really sincere about uh, giving the kind of security assurance that the, that the country needs. Well, I, I think it's a little odd to make those sorts of arguments today in 2018. It's a long time ago mm. that any kind of tit-for-tat, uh, quid pro quo type negotiation was on the table. 
what we've seen over a period of years has been defiance by North Korea of the UN Security Council. Multiple resolutions have essentially been ignored. And it's good that China and the United States, along with the other permanent members of the Security Council, have intensified the pressure on North Korea. Uh, because I think we're long past the stage of regarding what Kim Jong-un is doing as some legitimate pursuit of his own security. What he is doing uh, as a proliferator, uh, somebody who is uh, whose country has withdrawn from the non-proliferation regime is risking the possibility not so much of nuclear war I don't think he's about to fire missiles uh, at the United States or its allies but what he is risking is an escalation of proliferation throughout the region and it cannot be in China's interest any more than it's in the no. interest of the United States for that to happen so I think we're in agreement on this right. actually and it's one of the healthier aspects of Trump's foreign policy that uh, the UN Security Council has uh, acted together to try to check North Korea's increasingly reckless behavior and I think we're seeing less recklessness now from Kim Jong-un in his readiness to engage in talks with South Korea. So I think that's a positive step forward and it's an example of what the US and China can achieve when they work together, not only together but with Russia and Britain and France, on the UN Security Council. We're going to take a very short break and we'll be back right after this. Stay with us. Welcome back, and my guest today is Dr. Neil Ferguson, a best-selling author and senior fellow with the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. We kind of went off to this uh, uh, DPRK issue, which is a very important issue standing in the way of um, uh, U.S.-China relations. So looking again to 2018, do you think the risks of a trade war are more prominent? from the various signs with C? Yeah, I think it's quite probable that uh, the Trump administration is going uh, to impose tariffs. Uh, it already does impose tariffs, the United States, but I think these tariffs could be increased uh, on Chinese exports of steel and aluminium. I think it's also very likely that there will be much tougher uh, scrutiny of Chinese investments in, uh, in the US technology sector. So I think the atmosphere is likely to turn rather chilly mm -hmm. uh, on trade issues and I don't think any of us should be surprised about that. Uh, the only surprising thing really is that it's taken this long to happen uh, because remember if you rewind the tape a year uh, when President Trump delivered his inaugural address uh, in January 2017, he explicitly used the word protection. Uh, he used the phrase America first. And everything that he had said on the campaign trail had pointed in the direction of a more protectionist uh, U.S. trade policy. So the only surprising thing to me really is that it's taken 12 months for this really to become uh, a reality. But you think this trade war is going to do any good for the economy of the United States. I don't. I've been opposed uh, mm -hmm. to this policy. I am not a protectionist. Mm -hmm. I'm a free trader. I was shocked when Trump talked this way in his inaugural address, and I don't expect much good to come of it. Here I agree uh, with Bob Zellick, uh, who published an article on this subject uh, just this week, mm -hmm. former U.S. Uh, trade representative. I, I'm entirely in agreement with him. I don't think this is the right uh, course for the U U.S. to go down. But then uh, that's one reason that I was not an ardent Trump supporter in 2016. Why do you think he might launch the war in 2018? And especially one of the key advocates of this uh, anti-China narrative in the so-called Trumpism, Steve Bannon, he is out of the picture. Why do you think now the possibility is still there and even more there? That's a good question. But, but of course, Bannon was not the only me member of the administration who wanted to take this kind of line. Uh, I mean, I think if you look at Commerce Secretary uh, Wilbur Ross's statements, he's always made it fairly clear that the goal is to play a much uh, tougher game on trade issues with China. And it has been a central leitmotif of President Trump's rhetoric, not just since 2016, but frankly for decades. I mean, Trump made his reputation politically on protectionist policies right back in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that he was never going to do this never struck me as, as plausible. And just because Bannon's gone doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of, uh, of trade hawks still in the administration. So I think that this is likely to happen and I think it's going to be very interesting indeed to see what exactly the Trump administration can get mm -hmm. by doing this. I'm not sure terribly much is to be gained. It should be said that this is part of a wider 
uh, Trump's strategy to uh, challenge uh, prevailing norms in trade. NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, right. is something that Trump has repeatedly talked about scrapping. And we should, I think, not rule out that scenario too. So I think on trade, Trump is in 2018 going to deliver what he promised in 2016, but spent 2017 just tweeting about. Hmm. Well, let's uh, wait and see. Uh, you have just published this book that's called The Square and the Tower on um, networks and power from Freemasons to Facebook. It's a very interesting title about uh, and, and very interesting book I find. I haven't read it in full, but is it relevant, do you think, in today's U.S.-China relations, Absolutely. especially in the digital age. Absolutely. One can't really understand uh, world order today without recognizing the enormous importance of giant online social networks. Uh, and Facebook is just the latest of, of many social networks that have played a huge uh, a hugely important role in mm -hmm. history. And part of what has happened over the last 10 or 20 years has been the division of the world into two distinct internets. There's the American internet, which is dominated by the so-called fang companies, uh, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and I think Apple should probably be added to that list. And then there's another world, which is right. China's world, dominated by the BAT companies, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no other internet. The Europeans don't have one. The Russians barely have one. There are really two distinct worlds in cyberspace now. Uh, and this creates an extraordinary state of affairs. Uh, because these companies collectively know more about the Earth's population than right. any governments. Uh, and in the United States, I think there is an, an increasing tension between the power of Silicon Valley, between the power of the Fang companies, and that of uh, Washington, D.C. and the Trump administration. Whereas, what one sees in China, and I was at the Wuzhen uh, Internet Conference, uh, is a much closer partnership between the technology networks and uh, the Chinese government. So it's two very different systems that have emerged and I don't think anybody can really understand how power works in the world today without recognizing that that's the real division uh, in the world today. Not so much a division between states uh, but a division between two different models of how the internet should work. And how is that affecting um, the relationship of the two, two countries or rather maybe in your narrative the relationship of the two peoples? I think in, in two different ways. Because of the way that networks work, uh, in democracies, the existence of giant online social networks tends to lead to a kind of polarization uh, because the network encourages fake news and extreme views. We saw that very clearly in 2016 in the US election, but it was also true in the British referendum. In general, the European in general more extreme uh, opinions attract more clicks, exactly. more attention. And it, they don't necessarily need to be true. No. Uh, and this is, I think, an extremely disruptive phenomenon uh, for nearly every democracy in the world. Uh, of course, amongst the extreme views that can proliferate in that kind of atmosphere uh, are extreme views of nationalism. Uh, and so one danger, which I think is true of populism generally, uh, is that the social media encourage a kind of crude nationalism. Uh, one could imagine a scenario in which US-China relations could deteriorate partly because uh, they become the object of tweet storms. Now that hasn't really happened yet and I don't in fact see that much anti-Chinese sentiment amongst Americans. It's what about the other big, way around? <laughs> that's the thing. The other side of the story is really very striking. The Chinese views of the United States insofar as we can measure them online have become a good deal more negative in recent years. Uh, and I think many Americans slightly underestimate the extent to which their image in the rest of the world, and especially in China, mm -hmm. has really turned, uh, had turned south. Uh, this, this negativity, this increased nationalism that one sees online, I think is going to be a source of trouble in the future if governments aren't careful. For a lot of people in China though, um, they would say, what is what is being called nationalism is really what 
uh, the Chinese have been long wanting to say, or we have the feeling that we're finally saying what is the right thing, what we deserve, uh, because for so long we have been um, bashed, we have been um, demonized, we have been wrongly accused of, of many things we simply didn't do. So now it's the time finally we can express ourselves in, in, in a language that, uh, that, that is just down to earth, that is very easy to understand. How do you look at that kind of uh, feeling? Well, I think it, it, it's almost a mirror image of the populism that we've seen uh, in democratic societies in, in recent years. That the trouble is that no matter what the sentiment is, whether it's a sentiment about trade or about some territorial dispute or about history, once it's online, it will become more extreme. Uh, because it's, uh, and this has been shown by network science, it's the more extreme statements that tend to go viral. It's the more extreme tweets that tend to get retweeted on Twitter. And so the danger is that what we, what we get is a kind of amplification, uh, even of initially healthy right. sentiment. Mm -hmm. uh, I think everybody should be careful uh, of the ways in which giant social networks uh, allow extreme views to become dominant. Uh, this amplification effect is already very destabilizing in democratic systems, but there's no reason why it shouldn't be a source of instability uh, in China too. Uh, th these forces are hard for governments to control, and that's a central theme of my book. The square is the town square where people can network, where social networks operate, where markets operate, where things are informal. The tower is where government resides. For most of history, the tower is dominant, the tower of political hierarchy rules. But every now and then, and I think we're living through one of those times, technology empowers the square and it can create revolutionary challenges to the authorities in the tower that they underestimate at their peril. Right. Given the challenges and opportunities that you have mentioned, how can these two interact in a way so that not just the extreme goes viral, a healthy current of energy that is constructive to the development of both our uh, domestic society and international relations can flourish? Well, I, I think there are two answers to that question. The, the Chinese answer is essentially to make sure that this, uh, this public square that is the internet is quite carefully monitored by the authorities. Uh, and I think by carefully monitoring what goes on online, the Chinese government is doing its best to avoid the kind of phenomena that we're talking about. Uh, the alternative answer, which I think is the American answer, is essentially to allow as much to happen on cyberspace mm -hmm. as possible and censor as little as possible. The Europeans are kind of in the middle. The Europeans would like there to be some censorship. But they'd like the technology companies to do it for them. Now, in some ways, the Chinese answers the logical one. The logical one is really the state has to make sure that it has control of this giant public square. In the United States, we're running a rather strange experiment. And in the experiment, the companies that we're talking about know more about American citizens than the federal government mm -hmm. knows itself. And that's a very unusual experiment and not one that I expect to end well. Very interesting discussion. Of course, each country has their circumstances. The policy so. makers make the policy that they believe is the best for that country for that particular period of time. Anyway, many thanks. We have to leave it there. Uh, our guest today has been Neil Ferguson, best-selling author and senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at uh, Stanford University. And that's it for this edition of The Point with me, Lu Xin. Download the application called CGTN to watch our show on your mobile devices or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. I hope you got the point.